I'd like to welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for our second in the session of building a comprehensive nutritional practice. I see that we've got about five participants online and we've got a couple of phone participants. I'd like to thank you for joining us. And you'll notice on your screen that there is a chat window. Uh, you, may, you may use the chat window if you need to, if you want to ask any questions while things are going. Um, uh, that's one way that you can communicate with myself or Kathy. And uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that and integrate that into the, to the presentation as, as, it, as, it, as it's necessary. And it's about a minute after 1 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think most people are going to get caught up, and I'll do a little, a little introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Doble Bauer, and I'm a chiropractor in Livingston, Montana. And uh, I was uh, approached by Joseph uh, Antel with Standard Process West, and he uh, asked me if I would be willing to develop a... Uh, a program where we can mentor and teach newer practitioners uh, how to assess their patients, how to utilize nutrition in their in their in their clinics. So that's that's what we're doing today. So this is session two, and today we're going to get started looking a little bit into the symptom survey. And so th so the symptom survey is 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 our it's our, it's our window, it's our insight into our patient. It gives us a, an opportunity to look at uh, our patient. In fact, it kind of gave me pause because I saw this quote that said, uh, whenever you're examining someone's belongings, you're bound to learn many interesting things about that person of which you were previously not aware. And I, I really feel that's what the symptom survey is doing, is it's giving us an opportunity to look at our patient's symptoms or belongings and make an assessment of where they are, where they're at. Now, there's some confusion or there's some, some uh, conversation with regards to, do we call this the symptom survey or do we call it the system survey? We'll get to that in a minute. But the, you know, what we want to remember is, is that is when we're utilizing the symptom survey, it's, it's a tool. And we need to not get caught up in the, the, the chasing of symptoms. So the symptom is often just a sign that something more deep or underlying or foundational is occurring, and that's what this survey or the symptom uh, system survey can allow for or let us let us do. So one of the you know the things that that newer nutritional docs run into is uh, patients asking the question, "Hey doc, what do I take for this or what do I take for that?" And you might call that a cookbook approach. And I think that's a very valid approach and a very great place to start. What I would like to achieve with what we're doing today is really go beyond that. So our, our goal of, of today's presentation is to kind of understand how to use and how to correlate the subjective information from the symptom survey and marry it with some, some common objective findings, some examination findings, to help us better understand our patient's you know, foundational or underlying issues or weaknesses. So simply we're going to marry the symptom survey to a nutrition exam and that will help us make a more logical course of action that we can further explain to our patients so that we can provide some rationale to, to why we're doing the things that we're doing. And if we can explain that to our patients, we will get better, uh, better outcomes and, and better compliance. So the symptom survey form is great because it's an easy way to initiate uh, a conversation on nutrition. It gets patients interested. It saves time because uh, it, it's something that they can fill out on their time. And then you can look at it on your time and develop your plan. And then you can spend your time with that patient more effectively or efficiently. It uh, also helps the patients understand the greater range of health issues that you can address or aid with them. So if you're a chiropractor like myself, it, it often helps open the doors to, oh, you work with diabetes or you work with you know, this or that problem. It, it, it helps to establish that you're the, the specialist, that you're trained in more than just you know, so spinal issues or headaches or, or things that common patients might consider chiropractors is only focusing on biomechanical spinal problems. Uh, 
And it also provides a great tool that you can track your patient's progress and it establishes some, some management procedures and how you deal and how you work patients through your clinic. So who came up with the symptom survey? You know, there's, a, there's some differing opinions on this. And if you look at the book uh, that I have on this picture here, it's called Mastering Nutrition with the Symptom Survey. And that, that book is offered through uh, International Foundation for Nutrition and Health and a great entry-level book for getting you utilizing and working with the symptom survey. And, and a lot of what we're talking about today I've, I've taken from that text. Um, and basically that book suggests that Royal Lee and another doctor, uh, for those of you that joined us for session one, we learned a little bit about the history of Royal Lee. Dr. Melvin Page was another physician that was uh, a contemporary of, of Royal Lee's. And apparently they worked together as early as 1939, developing some of the, the, the beginnings of what was a, a formative symptom survey. Now, recently I've also been told that in the, the early 60s, uh, Royal Lee um, kind of put it out there to, to develop the symptom survey and he had several of his representatives, his, his SP reps, working on a more polished form or a finished form of the symptom survey and that was, I believe, spearheaded by, uh, by a representative out of Texas named Leo Rodeford. Either way, this has been around for a little while and it's a very effective means of, of working with patients and, and I think one of the reasons Royal Lee uh, was excited about it is because he he had read some studies that questionnaires or a symptom questionnaire was often a better means of determining the diagnosis of a given patient even more so than um, the traditional objective lab findings and, and things that would have normally occurred in a typical medical visit. So he had a lot of faith in the symptom survey and and I do too. So there is software that can allow you to utilize the symptom survey with a little bit more ease. And um, there's a couple of companies that offer that. We may talk about in, that in future uh, installments of, of, of what we're doing. But I, I just want to put it out there that they're, that they're out there. But right now, I kind of want to focus on, on, the, on the brass tacks, on the how do we do it by hand. Um, understanding the, the concepts behind it as opposed to the software. Now the benefit of the software is it does allow you to have some things available so it will have the clinical reference guide embedded into the software and so you can look up products and, and help make your decisions on what you want to deliver to your patients. Um, but if you have that clinical reference guide you've got that available uh, already. Now the other thing that we want to consider is uh, the nutritional exam and this is a uh, just a one form that uh, is is actually given in that in that uh, clinical reference guide as a means of kind of a reminder or a checklist of exams that you can perform to help determine what a patient will need or might need with regards to correlating that with your your findings uh, subjectively with the symptom survey and maybe your history with the patient but also objectively and in addition, you can use your own factors uh, like blood tests, saliva tests, uh, things of that nature to, to add to your diagnostic acumen. So today we're going to focus on, on digestion. And there's a few tests in digestion that we're going to review. And we're going to look at the symptom survey. Now the symptom survey, the, the section on digestion is, is actually the, the smallest, but arguably the most important. Now you'll notice that the symptom survey is, is broken up into categories uh, or systems. For instance, parasympathetic and sympathetic dominance, sugar handling or, or uh, how, you, how your body manages blood sugar, cardiovascular, liver and biliary. And over the next several uh, sessions, we're going to go through these and get an understanding of the questions and, and how they correlate. And today we're going to focus primarily on digestion. So each of those groups of the, of the symptom survey offer you some insight into the underlying physiology that may be needing support. So those symptoms are, are, are grouped to extract those foundational problems rather than to focus on those individual symptoms. That allows you to 
focus on that underlying cause or that, that not the tip of the iceberg, but the base of the iceberg. So for instance, uh, some questions from uh, group three are things like eating when nervous, an excessive appetite, hungry between meals, irritable uh, before meals, getting shaky when hungry, lightheaded if meals are delayed. These are all symptoms of hypoglycemia. And of course, group three is the, is the blood sugar regulation group. And <clears throat> the thing is, is we need to remember that sugar handling can often be related to the other groups like digestion and liver biliary. So for instance, you're shaky when hungry suggests that obviously your, your blood sugar is low and perhaps at your last meal you weren't assimilating and absorbing fat as effectively as you should and that could be a liver biliary problem. So you want to kind of cross check your blood sugar handling issues on your symptom survey with how their liver biliary symptoms are doing. And today, importantly, we want to you know, focus on, are they even digesting their food? Are they getting the nutrients from their, you know, from their food? Are they getting the macronutrients, like the protein and the fat? And are they getting the micronutrients, the, the B vitamins that are allowing them to, to utilize the, the ATP that's in the sugar that they're eating? So you can see that you know, that's why the very first slide today was kind of that spider web was to, to get you to understand that there's, a, there's an interconnectedness between each of these uh, categories and how they work together. So you can see where a person who's having difficulty handling sugar may go into a hypoglycemic state and that drives the adrenal glands to kicking out cortisol so that you can release some sugar from the liver and that's going to drive sympathetic parasympathetic imbalance. So more than just, hey doc, what do I take when I, when I get shaky? We need to think about how is this affecting the system as a whole. So this is where some of the controversy lies, is that some people call this a symptom survey, and some people call this a systems survey. But you will notice that they're exactly the same thing. So whether you call it a symptom survey or a system survey is really up to you. It makes no difference. Just understand that the original name was the symptom survey and that recently it's been kind of uh, termed the systems survey. I guess that's uh, a way to be more politically correct because we, uh, we chiropractors don't want to treat symptoms. We want to treat the cause. And so we'd, we'd prefer to call it a system survey, but uh, honestly, it makes no difference to me. What is important, however, is the delivery of this to your patient. So the thing that can uh, make or break this survey, whatever you call it, is, is when and how you give it to your patient. So you'll notice the instructions on both of these. I'm sorry, one of them isn't terribly legible, but they're virtually the same. So. I want to make sure that I give this to a patient kind of independent of any other paperwork. So I will probably do this on a second or third or fourth chiropractic visit. Or if this is a, a patient that's coming me, to me strictly for, for nutritional work, I, I may have them fill this out first all by itself. And then when they've completed it, then I'll give them their, their kind of new patient paperwork with their name and address and social and all that stuff. So when I hand them the symptom survey or I instruct my, my CA to how, how to give these to patients, I, 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 I sit the, the survey in front of them and I say, listen, there's going to be you know, 100 and some questions on here and they're all equally important. And some of them are, are duplicated and I want you to answer each of them. Now, some of them won't have an answer. So for instance, like uh, number uh, eight, let's say, gag easily. You may never ever gag, and if you never ever gag, if it's never a problem, leave it blank. And by leaving it blank, you've answered that question. Now, if you have a problem with gagging maybe once or twice a year, I would mark that a one. Now, if you find that, you know, when I brush my teeth, oh, two or three or four times a month, or maybe once a week, I, you know, get the back of my tongue and makes me gag. Okay, then that might be a two. 
So things that are happening well, several times a month, once or twice a week is a two. And then the things that are, that are happening constantly or consistently, daily or regularly, I want you to mark a three. So leave it blank if it doesn't apply. Once if it only happens once or twice a year. Mark it a two if it only happens once or twice a month. And then mark it a three if it's something that you're aware of virtually every day. But more importantly, and the most important thing on the symptom survey is this little box on the last page that's marked important. So this is where I want you to tell me what's giving you the most problem. And you can list it in the order of importance. So if today your primary complaint is your back pain, I want you to put that one number one. And if you're having some heartburn, I want you to put that number two. So whatever symptoms that you deem most problematic or most important, I want you to put in that space. That's important because ultimately, while it's, you know, as a practitioner, I want to improve their digestion and I want to enhance their, their detoxification pathways and I want to improve their circulatory function and all this. It means nothing to my patient if his, you know, for instance, if, if his number one complaint is I cannot maintain and achieve an erection, it doesn't do me any good to help his heartburn. It doesn't help me to, to do anything but to achieve the goal that he is trying to, to manage. Now, I also use that to my advantage because if I see that, that for instance, that's the, the case with this patient, I know that that's a circulatory problem. And so that I, when, I, when I'm looking at his symptom survey, I may be looking at the cardiovascular, liver biliary, and I'm trying to bring that full circle to the patient so that they understand that the reason why I'm trying to improve their carbohydrate consumption and their breakdown and utilization of, of sugar is because it's going to help their triglyceride levels. And if I can help their triglyceride levels, I can, I can take the, the, the thickness or the sluggishness out of the bloodstream and that's going to improve your circulation. And circulation is what is necessary for achieving and maintaining an erection. So I need to be able to tell them why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. So we call that your, your therapeutic rationale. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? So always remember the most important thing is what's important to the patient and being able to communicate to them why it is you're doing the things that you're doing from, from, a, from a nutritional or, or even just recommendation standpoint. So the thing that you'll, you'll soon find after you've done a few symptom surveys is that you are going to get a lot of twos and threes in basically three groups, the, the digestion group, the sugar handling group, and the liver biliary group. And is there something wrong? Well, yeah. I think for the most part in, the, in our society, we are our lifestyle choices including our diet and our daily habits, put a lot of strain on our digestive capacity. We tend to eat a lot of highly refined, refined carbohydrates and non-foods, and we just make lifestyle choices like smoking and alcohol consumption that, that drive difficulty in, in group five, which is liver and biliary problems. So no, there's not really anything wrong. You're just part of our society, but the thing is, is these are the, probably the most important groups because you cannot affect that patient until you start to affect their digestion and their sugar handling and their ability to detoxify. So we're going to probably be paying a particular amount of attention to these three groups because they're, they're arguably the, the more important groups. So as I said, in many cases, simply addressing digestion, sugar handling, and liver biliary problems will make a profound influence on all of their other issues. And explain that to the patient. You know, they, you know, one of the things that I'll tell my patients is, you know, you've probably heard that you are what you eat. And I say, well, that's close, but really you are what you absorb or assimilate because not everything you eat gets effectively absorbed. And if your doctor has you taking Prilosec or Pepsid, obviously you have a digestive issue. And if you're not digesting your proteins, you're not repairing your tissue and you wonder why your back is taking longer than it should to heal. 
So this is why I want to focus on your digestion or your sugar handling or these three main areas because these are the areas that get you absorbing and assimilating those nutrients. So I often, you know, well, another thing I might tell them is, you know, while this uh, vast array of supplements that, that you could take, you can go to me or the health food store or whatever, isn't going to be terribly helpful if you're not digesting them, if you're not assimilating it, if we're not fixing that digestive process first. To do that is, is, to, is to remodel your house while it's still on fire or that's one uh, analogy or one metaphor that I use with my patients. The other one is, um, um, you know, it, it does very little good to put a supercharger a turbo booster on your car and not have gas. So we want to, you know, work on those things that are going to fuel you first and the best way to fuel you is to get your digestion up and running. So that's why today's our primary focus is going to be on group number six, which is digestion. So proper digestion and elimination is, is absolutely required for optimal health. Disorders of the digestive system can lead to prox problems in indigestion and malabsorption, toxicity, uh, and basically what we've just said, a wise practitioner is quick to support digestion because that's going to be the, the, the system that's going to influence other changes more profoundly. So again, reiterating the first step to nutritional therapy is, is through the digestive tract and typically when, I, when I, at least when I'm talking about it, I tend to work from the top down. So today we're going to be focusing primarily on digestion from the mouth to about the ileocecal valve. So when we look at digestion, there are, there are basically nine questions in group six and a few uh, nutritional exam points, the HCL point and the enzyme point. So the patient may complain of things like loss of taste for meat, lower bowel gas several hours after eating, uh, burning stomach that, that eating relieves, a coated tongue, passing large amounts of foul smelling gas, indigestion uh, about a half an hour to hour after eating, irritable bowel, mucus colitis, uh, gas shortly after eating, and stomach bloating. So when my uh, patient is circling some twos and threes in this section, I am going to make a note of that and then make sure that I'm addressing that in my examination. So I want to take a moment right now to show you a YouTube video that I created of the, of the digested examination. Now, about halfway through this video, I do some of the gallbladder uh, examinations, and I'm going to skip that just to, to save time. So you'll, you'll see a little break in the video. That's me fast forwarding to the, to the parts that are, re are relevant to today's discussion. I'd like to review the nutritional examination for the upper digestive tract. We're going to start off with the hydrochloric acid point. So we're going to find the tip of the xiphoid, and we're going to come down one inch and against the costal arch inside, the, not inside, but against the rib cage. I'm palpating with about three to five pounds of pressure, and I'm looking for sensitivity. So I'll ask the patient, is that tender or sensitive? The second digestive point that we look at is the pancreatic enzyme point, again finding the xiphoid process down one inch and against the costal arch on the patient's right hand side. So that indicates the need for pancreatic enzymes, things like multizyme or enzacor. Thirdly, as we follow along, the other thing that I find is if you, if you were to draw a line from the xiphoid to the umbilicus at about halfway, this is also another point that uh, I, I tend to see a lot when there's gastritis and or overt um, ulcers in the stomach. So while I think of zypan and hydrochloric acid for this point, and I think of multizyme and enzacor for this point, and I think of beta food or AF beta food for gallbladder, whether it's chronic or acute, in this neighborhood here, this is where I'm thinking of things like uh, gastrex or ocrepepsin. Additionally, when you get some sensitivity that suggests maybe uh, an ulcer or some gastritis and it's backed up by the patient's history, I also check this left thumb web 
uh, as that tends to be kind of a stomach uh, reflex point on the left hand side. So that's a good quick review of upper digestive functions and the products that you would use uh, in, that, in that situation. So that was a review of the nutritional exam on the hydrochloric acid point and the enzyme point. And I threw in just a little bit of uh, extra for uh, that little stomach or indigestion point. Uh, and so to continue with the digestive system, obviously it's just responsible for chemically altering the substances that we eat uh, by allowing their utilization into the body. And Ultimately, we're breaking larger pieces of food down into smaller molecules so that we can pass them unhindered into our bloodstream and to our cells. And as we've already discussed, this is probably the most important group. You should be considering this on all patients before looking at other areas so that you can ensure that you're delivering the nutrients to the tissues and that we're addressing that assimilation or that uh, you are what you absorb. Now, the thing that you'll notice when you when you look at, uh, for instance, that book that I, I mentioned, the Mastering the Symptom Survey, uh, you you can read about a symptom, uh, like uh, for instance, um, when you get to group six and you see the this one here that says loss of taste for meat. The the common recommendation for that is to increase hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, uh, or uh, in, the, in this case, I tend to use Zypan. Uh, I want to go and I want to back that up with my with my nutritional exam. So that's when I will come down and, and check my my hydrochloric acid point that you just saw on that YouTube video and back that up. And when I see you know, when I see when I see that listed on the exam, then I'm doing that with the with the patient. I'm telling them, you know, according to your symptom survey, you've you've lost a little bit of of your taste for meat, and this point here suggests uh, that you may not be making enough hydrochloric acid, that you may not be effectively breaking down your 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 proteins as well as you should. So the, really, the goal is is to correlate these these issues that your patients are presenting. So the subjective information that we're getting from our patient is their history and their symptom survey. So if we're getting twos and threes in that group six, what other things is that patient experiencing? What other information may we be missing or might help us? So do they report is one of their important listings uh, heartburn or GERD? Are they on an over-the-counter or a prescription acid blocker like Prilosec or Pepsid or Rolaids or Tums? Have they had problems with calcium, iron, or other mineral supplements? If you're not making adequate stomach acid, you're not going to assimilate calcium and you may find that it constipates you. So when a patient says, boy, I've taken calcium and it just makes me constipated or it makes me feel bad or I can't I'm allergic to calcium and that's when I usually go mm -hmm, okay uh, knowing that it's impossible to be allergic to calcium but I hear it not infrequently uh, similarly with iron or potentially if the patient may also be in their objective information they may be showing signs of anemia so they may be having a little macrocytic or microcytic anemia showing they're not getting enough iron or enough B12 uh, the other thing that we often see is a uh, person with that chronic cough, that little tickly cough, particularly worse uh, first thing in the morning or at night when they're sleeping, they're waking up and they're coughing. So what that often suggests is that that stomach acid is, is backing up and going up the esophagus. So frequently I will, I, I generally on the back of the symptom survey, I get my pencil out and when I'm talking through the, my findings with the patient, I, I sort of draw a little picture that looks like this. I draw them a little stomach and a little pancreas and a little liver and a gallbladder. And I tell them that this sphincter right here called the cardiac sphincter uh, sometimes doesn't pull tightly like a good purse string should. And those stomach contents are going 
back up your esophagus and as a result they're irritating your throat and your, your voice box and that's uh, you know tickling you and making you cough which is also a concern with regards to a coated tongue. So you'll notice uh, question number 101 says coated tongue. If your stomach contents are backing up and basically killing the, the good flora uh, on your tongue, now the opportunistic flora are going to take hold and they're going to be more sticky and more slimy and they're going to uh, tend to attract your coffee that you just drank for breakfast or the last thing that you ate. So when I see the back of a person's tongue it looks brownish or whitish or grayish or greenish, um, I think, okay, perhaps they're, they're regurgitating some of their stomach acid or stomach contents and that's what's causing this. So when I see that in an exam, I say, do you cough in the morning? And they say, yeah, I do. And then, but it goes, it gets better by 10, so I don't worry about it. And I said, you know, do you get heartburn? So this may be something on a, on a patient that I haven't given the symptom survey yet to, but just in the course of my typical chiropractic evaluation, I'm seeing and I say, you know what, I think on your next visit, I would like you to fill out a, a symptom survey so that we can get a better idea of what might be causing some of these other problems uh, beyond just the, you know, the spinal issue that they may have presented for, which could have been a, you know, a middle back problem. And I also, you know, reinforce to them that, you know, the that T spine and the nerve supply to that sphincter is 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 uh, could be allowing for that problem. So obviously, my chiropractic uh, is is going to be important as well to improving the quality of the tension or the strength of that sphincter. So you can see, when we correlate this clinically, we're becoming a better practitioner and we're communicating to our patients better and they appreciate it. And an appreciative patient refers. So the other objective information that we look for uh, is obviously palpatory tenderness at the, the, the nutrition exam points. Uh, and I'm, often we'll have a, uh, opportunity to look at their CBC, so I'm checking to see if, there, if there's signs of uh, larger red blood cells or smaller blood, red blood cells. If they're smaller, I'm thinking iron, I'm thinking zinc. Zinc is obviously important because that helps us make hydrochloric acid. We'll talk about that in a moment. And um, and I, 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 I will occasionally look into things like hair mineral analysis, things like that. And uh, the other thing to think about is that persistent sore throat. So when uh, a person constantly has a sore throat, they may not be experiencing heartburn or indigestion, but they just always have a sore throat. And that could be from that regurgitating stomach content that's irritating the, the oropharynx. So relying on subjective information alone is, is going to not allow you to be the, the practitioner that you should be. You know, it looks like the, the layout on the slide isn't very good, but the, the idea here is that is I want to, when I'm communicating with my patient, I want to give them a, a, a rationale for why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And, and I want to use it as an opportunity to open the lines of communication to see what they may be doing. So when they're telling me about perhaps maybe their sore throat or their morning cough, and I go down the line of, well, do you have any heartburn or indigestion? Have you taken any Prilosec? Are you, are you doing anything? And they're like, no, no, I've got no problems there. And you know, then that opens the conversation of, oh, but you know what? I don't, I don't eat any almonds because if, as long as I don't eat almonds, I'm okay. But if I, if I eat almonds, then that makes things really bad. So I just don't eat almonds. So now you're starting to put together a picture that. Uh, perhaps the, the, the protein matrix in the almonds is more difficult for them to digest. That causes irritation. I see this frequently with gluten-containing foods. So that's one of the, the common di digestive irritants is the gluten in, in grain. And I, and I tell that to my patients. I, I, I try to make that part of the, the, the talking about is, 
you know, grains are, are more difficult to digest. And if you're having difficulty with that, that may be an issue with your ability to, to, to fully break that down. And, that, and that's your stomach's responsibility. So it looks like we may have some work to do on improving your stomach. When you take the time to analyze and, and correlate this information and communicate to your patient, that's what will make you a wizard. So the other thing that I, that I would challenge you not to overlook is just simple recommendations that we sometimes forget to give uh, that, that can make a whole lot of difference. For instance, making sure your patients are chewing their food and that they're eating in, a, in an appropriate environment that isn't too stimulatory or too sympathetic charging. Uh, some people do a lot better by keeping their liquid consumption during meals lower. And when a person drinks too much during a meal, that can dilute their stomach acid concentration and inhibit their ability to absorb that meal. So one of the recommendations I make to my patient is I want you to, for the next, you know, five meals, I want you to drink as little water or as little fluid during that meal as possible and see how that does, see how that changes things. So just drink enough to keep your, your, your throat lubricated so that you can swallow, but don't drink uh, any more than that. And then the obvious, you know, avoid overeating. If, if, you, if you need a helmet for your meal, that's probably uh, not a wise uh, decision. So this is a great opportunity to uh, kind of explain a little bit of patient management. So as I'm going through the symptom survey or as I'm going through their history, I've got this in front of them and I'm writing down my recommendations uh, for, for what I might give that patient. And the schedule gives an opportunity to put a lot of information and something about this, this particular so software that we're viewing this on today kind of skews it, but you get the idea that right here, obviously we put our, our product and how and our you know frequency and, and how much and when to take them. But I usually use this little space over here on the right to explain why I'm doing Zypan. So I might write, this is going to help improve your protein digestion, or this is going to increase your hydrochloric acid so that you can break down the proteins, or this is going to, you know, or Gastrex. Uh, oftentimes I, I, I talk about Gastrex as being uh, very similar to aloe vera on a sunburn. So that, that pain that you're feeling in your stomach, uh, you know, if you have a sunburn, we put aloe on it, it feels better. You have a sunburn in your stomach, we put Gastrex in there, add a little water, because it's virtually, I, I, I tell my patients it's instant snot, that you just add water. And the, the, the stomach should have uh, you know, an adequate mucus layer. I, I, tip, I typically say snot with my patients because it's, it's entertaining and it breaks the ice. And, you know, then I can joke or tease that, you know, Gastrex is my instant snot. So sometimes I'll even write that on there. If the patient really connects with that idea, I write on there instant snot, just add water. So that tells them that this is the, the thing that's protecting their stomach. And when I'm, you know, when I'm drawing these pictures for them, I, I, I tell them, you know, there's a, a layer, uh, there's a, a, a host of specialized cells in your stomach that create a, a, a protective layer of mucus or snot in your stomach. And that's what protects you against the production of hydrochloric acid, which is what you need to break down your food. Now, the problem is, is your esophagus does not have those cells, so you do not get snot in your esophagus, which is why it hurts when it comes back up and it burns. So right now, your stomach has an irritation or a sunburn. The medical term just happens to be gastritis. And so we're going to put a little bit of aloe vera, or in this case, Gastrex, uh, into your stomach, add some water to hydrate it, and that's going to afford your stomach the opportunity to, A, create more hydrochloric acid because it can. It's no longer irritated. It doesn't feel... Uh, uh, afraid of making more hydrochloric acid. I often tell you know, my patients, the body is infinitely intelligent. It doesn't make mistakes. It knows that if you're not making snot in your stomach, it's, you're, it's not going to make hydrochloric acid because it doesn't want to irritate it. 
So these are ways that I approach talking to my patient is saying, listen, you know, we need the snot layer, that's gastrex. So I <clears throat> write that appropriately when I'm uh, filling out their, their, their um, patient schedule. Um, and in my special instructions over here, I'm going to put my lifestyle recommendations, things like, you know, make sure you're chewing your food, avoid eating too much, you know, uh, give thanks or reflect before a meal. Uh, and that's what I might, if I have the time, I'll talk to them about. There's been some studies that show that you get better nutrient assimilation when you pray before you eat. Now, I don't know the religion or the beliefs of my patients, so I don't get too excited about it, but I say it, you, you don't necessarily have to pray to God or whatever, whatever. You just need to spend a minute to focus on being thankful for that food and reflecting, and just uh, a moment of, of silence or thanks will help you bring your body into that parasympathetic state, which is going to allow you to create more digestive enzymes and more hydrochloric acid so that we can get to a point where we don't need to give you this anymore, the Zypan, so that you can start doing this on your own. So when we're looking at the upper digestive tract, I tend to think of it in three, kind of three categories. I'm thinking of it in the needs for hydrochloric acid, pepsin, and protein digestion, so hydrochloric acid support. Secondarily, I think of, of, of the need for enzyme support or more, or more of a, you know, a pancreatic approach. And then finally, um, I'm afraid on this slide it's been cut off just because of the, the limitations of the software, but that should say membrane support right here on the right. So this is membrane support. Uh, membrane support is, is the integrity of the epithelia that makes up that digestive tract. So if we're losing integrity in that, in that intestinal membrane, in that intestinal barrier, this is where we start talking about leaky gut syndrome and things of that nature. And further down the line, then we start to talk about dysbiosis and problems there. So we're going to start with hydrochloric acid support and the things that we focus on. But first, there's two things to consider for the really out of the ordinary, the really difficult, or the patient that comes in and says, you know what, I've been doing hydrochloric acid, and I did this and I've done that, and, and nothing has seemed to help. That's uh, when you may want to consider pituitrophin. Uh, pituitrophin is... The pituitary is, you know, the gland that rules them all, or in this case, you know, I put the ring that rules them all in kind of reference to um, the Lord of the Rings, in that the pituitary controls so many other bodily functions when all else fails, sometimes going way upstream to the, to the endocrine system, and the pituitary will help with more difficult digestive problems. And the other thing to consider is, uh, is the patient creating enough saliva? And are they having problems with, with the salivary portion of digestion? So occasionally parotid uh, protomorphogen or parotid PMG can be very helpful for, for those patients. But those are, those are special occasions. I don't tend to use those. And because I'm often supporting my patient's endocrine uh, system with a product like Simplex F or Simplex M, I know that I'm getting a little bit of pituitary support in those products. So I feel confident that I'm, that I'm covering that base if I'm doing a little endocrine support. So th there are main reasons why most people become hydrochloric acid deficient, why they're not breaking down their proteins. Probably uh, the most common is going to be stress. Uh, virtually none of us are, are exempt from stress. And so driving that <coughs> sympathetic response will shut down our parasympathetics. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to talk to my patients fairly frankly. And I, I, I talk to them about sympathetic and parasympathetic balance because I think they understand the idea of fight or flight. And I'll tell them, you know, if you see a grizzly bear in the woods, your pulse will go up and your pupils will get big. That's 
fight or flight. If you step over a rattlesnake, that's the same thing. If you have to give a speech in front of a thousand people, you're going to see a certain set of physiologic reactions occurring that are driving you to fight or flight. That's this side of the equation. On the opposite side of the equation is the parasympathetic nervous system, and that is what is responsible for your ability to digest food and reproduce. So we think of the, you know, kind of the right side of the spectrum, and I, and I kind of draw it on, the, on a piece of paper form. I say, you know, this over here is, is sympathetic, and this over here is parasympathetic, and this is our, you know, kind of our spectrum, and that should have been a straight line. And then here in the middle is homeostasis or balance. So we want to be in the middle most of the time. When it's time to eat or time to reproduce, so this is feed and breed, we want to take that system over here. If you're constantly under stress, whether that be work stress or money stress or marital stress, your set point may be over here. <clears throat> so to get you over here is going to be difficult. For you to run away from a grizzly bear with an erection is impossible. It's very difficult to maintain an appetite when you're running for your life. Those are manifestations of the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have to manage stress. So that's another thing to consider when you're working with those patients is, you know, when are you eating? Are you watching the nightly news? Are you watching the stock report? You know, what, what's, what's driving your behavior when you're eating? Maybe we can fix this simply by making sure that you're eating your meals in a quiet uh, spot with no, no, no input, no, no, no bad news. Um, of course, our eating habits are another reason why hydrochloric acid levels are deficient. Um, lack of thiamine, uh, zinc, uh, and B6 are all necessary for the production of hydrochloric acid. So it's not uncommon for me to consider uh, like chelated zinc or zinc liver chelate, uh, sometimes even ferro food, depending on the situation, to provide those minerals necessary to, to help produce hydrochloric acid. Uh, I also consider cataplex B. Uh, antacids are another reason why uh, patients are, are hydrochloric acid deficient, they're, they're dumbing it down. They're, they're, because they don't know any better, because the, they're, they're having difficulties with irritation in their stomach, and they think that it's as a result of too much stomach acid, they're, they're, they're hurting themselves by taking those. And, and then as we know, as we age, we, we produce less hydrochloric acid. So it's not uncommon to see more problems in our, in, in our over 50 population patients. So uh, we, we just spoke about zinc, and, and zinc is a, uh, a pretty common, likely the most common mineral deficiency. And one of the reasons that I believe that is is because we just don't have too much uh, zinc-rich foods in our diet. So we're going to get that primarily from animal products, from oysters and, and shellfish. And there are anti-nutrients or phytates in, in grains particularly, but also in legumes and, and, and potatoes to some degree that inhibit our ability to assimilate and absorb zinc. So when I, you know, back to this guy right here, when I'm talking to him and I say, you know, I'm giving you this chelated zinc product, this zinc product, because I need to get you zinc so you can make your own hydrochloric acid so that we can eventually get you not taking this, but I need you taking this now so that you can get your, you know, get your food digested now. And as we go by, as you start making your own and you start doing better, we'll start seeing less need for the aloe vera and the extraneous hydrochloric acid because you're making your own, particularly if you're changing your lifestyle. So, it's important that, the, that, the, that our digestive process, the chyme, the, the, the mixture of food and saliva in our stomach, uh, hits a pH of somewhere between 1 and 3. In order to do that, we need adequate hydrochloric acid. When that is absent, we may need to augment or add to that temporarily or sometimes indefinitely to 
get you to a situation where you're digesting your food more appropriately. When you do, that's when we start seeing improvements in the loss of taste for meat, burning stomach, eating your leaves, uh, passing large amounts of foul-smelling gas, coated tongue, stomach bloating, those symptoms on your survey. And also important to remember that without proper hydrochloric acid production and intrinsic factor, we don't absorb and assimilate B12. And that's when we'll start seeing that macrocytic or larger uh, red blood cell anemia. So the primary product that I utilize is Zypan. There is another hydrochloric acid product called betaine hydrochloride. And most people call it betaine. And recently I've read that it's, it's appropriate or proper uh, pr uh, pronunciation is, is uh, betaine, betaine. Uh, and that was primarily because it was derived from beet, and it's a it's a chemical bond, whatever. Anyway, Zypan is my source of hydrochloric acid, and the other product is is betaine hydrochloride. Uh, the reason I tend to choose Zypan over over uh, betaine hydrochloride is that it also contains the digestive enzymes uh, from the pancreas, the protease, the amylase, and the lipase, and it also contains uh, a little bit of pepsin and we'll learn a bit about pepsin in, in just a moment. So you'll see that Zypan supports digestion of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, restores a healthy hydrochloric acid level, it aids in the breakdown of calcium and iron, and it is essential for B12 absorption. So one of the other things that is in Zypan is a little bit of, of, of porcine stomach, which, is, which provides the intrinsic factor, which allows for intestinal absorption of B12 So if we look at uh, uh, Guyton's physiology, and I apologize, this, uh, this slide on, on this uh, software kind of doesn't condense it like it should, but the, the notes that are on my web page will be in a PDF format and they won't be congested like this. Uh, so what Guyton said was that one of the important features of pepsin digestion is its ability to digest collagen which is an albuminoid that is affected little by other digestive enzymes. Collagen is the major constituent of the intracellular connective tissue of meats. And for the digestive enzymes of the digestive tract to penetrate meats and digest that cellular protein, it is first necessary that we digest the collagen fibers. So consequently, in persons lacking peptic activity in the stomach, the ingested meats are less well penetrated by the digestive enzymes and therefore poorly digested which sounds a whole lot like loss of taste for meat. This is why we give Zypan, because it has hydrochloric acid, and it has a little bit of pepsin to help us break down the collagen in our meat so that we can more effectively or efficiently assimilate the protein. So you'll see up here, he talks about how it's vital that for, for pepsin to work, we need to have a pH of about two or three in the stomach. And without that, we will inactivate pepsin. And if it, pepsin is inactivated, we do not assimilate, or we don't break down collagen, and that's where the troubles begin. Uh, so there are a few studies on, on betaine hydrochloride and, and, and its effectiveness on improving digestion. And another interesting thing is that adequate betaine hydrochloride levels will inhibit helicobacter. So the helicobacter pylori is the, is the bacteria that's, that's given the distinction of being the cause of ulcers. I dispute that a little bit. I don't think it's the cause. I don't think rats cause garbage dumps. I do think that garbage dumps attract rats. So the problem is, is if you've got a garbage dump and it's full of rats, we've got to get rid of the rats. So occasionally there's a situation where we will want to uh, need to work on eradicating H. pylori, but recognize that it is not the cause. I think it is, in fact, the effect, but still something that needs to be addressed. And uh, one of the things that I can do to help affect helicobacter is Zypan. So again, <clears throat> on my you know patient schedule uh, on Zypan, I may put improved protein digestion, inhibit helicobacter pylori. And this is important because they may have already been to their, their medical doctor, and the medical doctor has done a, a breath test for H. pylori, or maybe you will do it. 
and that way you can determine the severity and how to approach it because there's other things that we can do uh, further that we'll talk about that can in influence how Helicobacter uh, behaves. <clears throat> now occasionally we run into a situation where uh, the they are experiencing a lot of abdominal distress and they have uh, signs that are more indicative of gastritis and uh, we sort of mentioned that on the on the YouTube exam video. Uh, this is when I do things like Gastrex or Ocopepsin and again I sort of already described how this is my, my, my mucus layer or my instant snot that will protect the stomach against its own hydrochloric acid production as well as the acid that comes from making you know uh, a mishmash of of your wine and your steak and your asparagus and all the food that you just ate and if you're digesting that appropriately that should be out of your stomach in two hours if it is not then uh, that is a problem and that's what's washing up and irritating you when you're laying down in bed at night so another uh, you know lifestyle thing that I might put on their uh, form here is uh, you must eat at least three hours before you lay down for bed. So that way that will inhibit the, the stomach contents from coming back up. And if they still are, then we know that that food is, is sitting in their stomach too long. So Gastrex uh, is not in fact instant snot, but it is bentonite clay and a little bit of anise and some porcine stomach to also help with the B12 absorption. The thing that makes it very snot-like is the al alginaic acid and uh, this is, is basically a very slimy uh, and slippery product that absorbs and adsorbs water really effectively. That's why Gastrex says take this with a glass of water uh, 15 minutes before your meal. So it is in fact alginaic acid that does that. And, you know, my patients aren't stupid. I say, you know, you've probably heard of people that drink aloe vera juice or people that, that uh, do slippery elm or marshmallow root. All of these constituents are basically uh, mucus-like products. So that's exactly what we're doing is we're giving you something very much like marshmallow or something very much like aloe vera in the attempt to protect the irritation from the sunburn, which is currently occurring in your stomach. So uh, occasionally there are uh, overt ulcers in the stomach. Those patients are going to usually present with substantially more pain and probably a fairly stressful uh, situation that's going on in their life as well. So that needs to be addressed. And you may want to consider also some adrenal support. But when ulcers are present, uh, Gastrex is often the first thing I use. And then I look into some other things like chlorophyll complex pearls. Uh, because that's important for uh, detoxifying and it's very soothing. Uh, secondarily is Cataplex AC, which is probably my primary product for helping membrane integrity, which is that third part of, uh, of looking at upper digestion that we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about briefly in a moment. So when uh, I have a more severe heartburn or, or, or ulcer patient, this is when I look to the MediHerb line and a particularly a product called HiPEP. So HiPEP is a, is a deglycerinized licorice, meadowsweet and chamomile product, and it will help reduce stomach acid secretions so that we can get a situation where we can promote healing in the intestinal and, and stomach lining. I think it also helps with creating a bit better mucus barrier, and it, I, I, I my belief is the licorice is also affecting uh, H. pylori as well. So uh, when, I, when I'm absolutely certain H. pylori is present, I will oftentimes add uh, a little bit of uh, golden seal. You'll notice on my, my little pretend uh, patient management, I put golden seal on there. And my reasoning was to kill the H. pylori. Or for the patient, I might say to, to get rid of the rats. So the, the next thing we consider is kind of the, the digestive enzyme component, which is uh, the most common product that we utilize is Multizyme. And Multizyme is basically a combination of bromelain from pineapple and papain from uh, papaya. 
and this is providing the 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 nutrients that are going to help break down the further components of your proteins, your polypeptides, and your your uh, carbohydrates and your your fatty acids. So for the patient that I know, we've got to get them digesting their food because without it, they're just not going to heal. But they do have an ulcer or they have some fairly severe gastritis that the addition of Zypan is irritating. I will do something like Multizyme. And I'll also utilize my nutritional exam to, to help make that decision for me. So if I'm on their costal arch and I'm on their hydrochloric acid point and that one's not that big of a deal, but I hit their enzyme point and it's more activated, then I will probably defer more towards a product like Multizyme. And I, there's a few slides here on the on the effectiveness of bromelain and, and papain, how it improves digestive capacity, particularly with things like gluten. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention was Enzacor. This is a relatively new product, and I, I'm using it more and more because I I, I, I I sort of think of it as as Multizyme Plus. Uh, basically, it's containing the bromelain and and the papain and some of the other things that are going to help with uh, breaking down uh, the proteins and, and carbohydrates. But the thing that makes Enzacor special, in my opinion, is the L-glutamine. So L-glutamine has a lot of really good recent research on its effectiveness at, at repairing that, uh, that intestinal membrane. So particularly the, the, the gap junctions in the small intestine. So the, uh, there's a recent study I just put on here. Uh, that talks about its ability to uh, basically repair tissue that's been disrupted. So it prevents the disruption of, of the tight junctions in the small intestine. So this helps repair a person with leaky gut. In addition to adding the, the enzymes that, are, that allow for, for better digestion. So we're about two minutes past the hour and I'd like to leave you with a kind of an action step. So for, for those of you new practitioners that haven't had the opportunity to experience this, uh, you know, a symptom survey and how it's done, why don't you go ahead and fill out a symptom survey form and fax that to Joseph or Joseph will get you in contact with one of the, one of the SP West mentors who can go over that, that's, that symptom survey form with you to, to help you get started on uh, assimilating this information. So the, the, the difficulty of, of what's in front of us is, uh, you, you, you may have heard the, the, the saying, how do you eat a whale? Well, you eat a whale one bite at a time. So the understanding of the symptom survey and all of the, the different systems and their interconnections is, is a bit of a whale. And to, to keep in what, we, what we're trying to talk about today in digestion is uh, I didn't want to overeat. I wanted to try and get as much information as I could. So we didn't quite make it all the way through digestion today. We made it about to the, to the ileocecal valve. So next time we'll talk a little bit more about lower digestive function. And as time allows, we're going to start working into liver biliary and blood sugar uh, balance. So uh, with regards to upcoming educational opportunities, uh, there's the SP West calendar of events. And um, if you click on those, you can, uh, and then the notes, it'll lead you to those, those, those um, web pages that'll get you what's going on with the upcoming seminars. Uh, we have a teleconference uh, next week, the Montana Nutrition Collaboration. Uh, and that's gonna be Dr. Parrish out of St. Louis. He's gonna be talking about sirtuins and um, heat shock proteins and things to, to manage and get a little bit of an understanding about that. And of course, mentoring the mentors is Dr. Stuart White's uh, program where he educates uh, about every other month on the fourth Thursday of the month. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. If you have any uh, questions or issues, you can type them in the chat window and if you have any suggestions or other issues, you can either call me at my office number, which is 222-9373, or you can speak with Joseph Antel at his phone number, which is 203-257-0306. And you see his email address right here. 
And this is my email address right there. So thanks everybody for joining us. Give me a, a chat message that let me know how we did and if there's any questions or things that weren't covered so that we can perhaps uh, talk about this next time. Thanks a lot.